At this point in this course, we've learned quite a bit about Docker containers, about images, about Docker CLI, and Docker Compose. But we still don't know a lot about how to actually use Docker in a production type environment. In other words, how do we actually develop an application that uses Docker and then eventually push it to some outside hosting service like AWS or DigitalOcean? Well, in this section and the next couple of videos, we're going to get a much better idea of how we do that by walking through an entire workflow that uses Docker to author and publish an application. In this section, I'm going to show you a couple of diagrams to give you an overview of the flow that we're going to implement. Now, when I say flow, I'm talking about the process of developing, testing, and then eventually deploying your application, and then most importantly, at some point in the future, doing some additional development, additional testing, and then redeploying the application. So it's not enough to just deploy an application one time. No app gets deployed one time. Instead, we deploy an app, we do some additional development, we make some changes, and we re-push the application. We redeploy some additional changes. So it's really important to make sure that any flow that we come up with has the ability for us to do some additional development, testing, and redeployment in the future. So with that in mind, let's take a quick break. In the next section, we're going to come back and start talking about the flow that you and I are going to implement. In the last section, we started talking about how we're going to develop a development workflow that's going to allow us to develop our application, test it in some fashion, deploy it, and then repeat that process all over again. So in this section, we're going to start talking about some more specifics around that flow. Now, I'm going to give you a diagram here that's going to be just a little bit interactive. So I'm going to add in a couple of elements as we go through this description over time. The important thing to keep in mind here around this diagram is that we're not going to talk too much about Docker's flow in this just yet. Instead, I'm going to focus on telling you about some outside services and outside technologies that we're going to use to set up this development workflow. Once we kind of understand the core principles or the kind of design behind this development workflow, we'll then kind of introduce Docker and tell about how Docker kind of facilitates everything. Okay, so let's get to it. Our development workflow is going to revolve around creating a GitHub repository. This GitHub repository is going to kind of serve as the central point of coordination for all the code that you and I are going to write and then eventually deploy to outside, outside hosting service. Our GitHub repository is going to have two different branches. One branch we're going to call the feature branch. This feature branch is essentially a development branch of sorts. This is the branch that you and I are going to add code to, make changes, or do whatever it is we need to do to update our application. We're also going to have a master branch. A master branch, it belongs to traditionally every Git repository that you might make. Our master branch is going to kind of represent our very clean working copy of our code base. Any changes that we make to this master branch right here are going to be eventually automatically deployed out to our hosting provider. Let's now draw on a couple arrows here to kind of walk through the process through which you and I are going to make changes to our code base and then eventually deploy those. So everything is going to start off with you and I on some local development machine like your desktop or your laptop. You and I are going to pull all the latest code that we have from our feature branch. And so we're going to imagine that maybe you are working on this project with some other engineer, and maybe they have already published some amount of code on this feature branch. So you're going to pull down that code base. And then on your laptop, you are going to make some amount of changes to the application. After you've made those changes, you'll then push those changes back up to the GitHub repository again, to the feature branch. You are never going to push code directly to master. You're only going to pull and push code from the feature branch. Once you push your changes up to this feature branch, you'll then create what is called a pull request. So we're gonna make a pull request to take all the changes or all the new features that you've added to this feature branch right here and merge them over to the master branch. So this kind of merging of code from feature over to master is done by what we call that pull request. Now this pull request right here, or this request to add some code from feature over to master is going to set off a series of actions that are going to kind of govern how you manage your code base. So once you create this pull request right here, and then eventually merge it into master, two very important things are going to occur. First off, when you make this little pull request, we're going to set up a workflow that is going to automatically take 
our application and push it over to a service called Travis CI. Travis CI is a continuous integration provider. And essentially what they do is pull down your code and run a set of tests that you write on your code base. These are tests that you are going to write yourself. Now, for your particular application or wherever you go and use this flow, you'll end up using tests relevant to your particular application or whatever language you're working with. For our application, the one that we're going to kind of test this flow out on, we're going to just be making use of a couple of pre-generated tests. So we don't need to worry too much about the testing for right now. Assuming that Travis CI is able to pull all the code from our master branch and run tests on it successfully, Travis CI is then going to be set up to automatically take our code base, take our entire project, and push it over to some Amazon Web Services hosting. So essentially this entire flow is going to be depending upon you pushing some code up to this feature branch, creating the pull request, merging the pull request with the master branch, and the instant you do that, we'd run our tests. If the tests run successfully, Travis CI will automatically deploy your application to AWS. So that is the flow in a nutshell. Now this flow is a little bit complicated, so I want to talk about the entire flow again, like from start to finish, one more time in a slightly different format, just kind of a different diagram here, just to give you kind of a different take on what's going on. If you feel like you already understand this flow, that's totally fine. Take a pause right here and skip over to the next video. Otherwise, I'm going to give you essentially the same description again, but with a different set of diagrams. All right, so we can kind of imagine that we're going to have three phases to our project here. We've got the dev phase, the testing phase, and the production phase. During the dev phase, you and I are going to make some number of changes to our code base. And again, these are all going to be made to a branch that is not the master branch. We're going to call it our feature branch because it's where we develop new features. Once we make our changes to that feature branch, we're then going to push our changes to GitHub, and then we're going to create a pull request to merge with the master branch. As soon as we make that pull request, we are going to set up Travis CI to automatically pull that master branch with the new and updated code. Travis CI is then going to run our tests. If all the tests are executed successfully, we're going to say, great, we can merge all the changes over to the master branch. We're going to again push our code over to Travis CI. We're going to test the, run the test one more time and then have Travis CI automatically deploy our application over to AWS services, or essentially a very specific, very specific service that is called Elastic Beanstalk. Okay, so that's kind of the whole flow that we're gonna go through here in two different diagrams. Let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and start talking about how Docker fits into all this stuff. In the last section, we started talking about the development workflow that we're going to be putting together to develop, test, and deploy our application. We're not gonna talk about the role that Docker has in all this stuff. So first off, something you might've noticed as we were going through the flow in the last two sections, even though I said, oh yeah, we're not gonna talk about Docker just yet, you might notice that even with all those steps that we just went through, well, we didn't really talk about Docker one bit. Nowhere inside this series of steps, Nowhere inside of talking about GitHub and using branches and Travis CI and AWS did we ever make one mention of needing to use Docker. And that's kind of the key thing to be aware of here. Docker is not a requirement for using this development workflow. I personally used exactly this workflow that we're talking about at several startups that I've worked at without using Docker one bit. Docker was not involved. So to execute this workflow, we absolutely do not have to make use of Docker. Docker is just a tool that's going to make executing some of these tasks a lot, lot easier. That's the sole purpose of Docker that we're going to, that's the only reason we're going to be using it for this flow. It makes our lives easier. It's not necessarily a requirement for any of the stuff that we're going to be doing. So with that in mind, it might seem like at some points in time, we are not paying quite so much attention to Docker. It's gonna seem like at some points in time when we're going through this flow, we are paying a lot more attention to GitHub or AWS or Travis CI, and that's all totally okay. I want you to see how to use these services along with Docker. But again, Docker is not really the focus here. It's about understanding how we use Docker with these services. So with that in mind, one more quick break. We're going to come back to the next section, and we're going to start working on this development workflow. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a moment. In the last couple of sections, we started talking about the development workflow that we're going to implement. 
Remember, we don't have to use Docker for this stuff, it's just that Docker makes life easier. In this section, we're going to start installing a dependency or two to generate the project that we're going to eventually wrap up inside of a Docker container and then serve to the outside world. Now, the application we're going to make is going to have essentially no custom code from you and I. We're going to generate a project using a little project generator, and we're going to wrap that up inside of our Docker container. So I'm very much aware that if you're in this course, you might not have a background in, say, JavaScript. And if you do, you might not have a background in Ruby. And if you have a background in Ruby, you might not have a background in Java. And so it's kind of tough for me to pick just one language or one particular framework or whatever it might be that everyone 100% of the time is going to be familiar with for this workflow. So we're not gonna to pay too much attention to the actual code that is running inside the container. We're gonna be much more concerned with what the container is being used by. That's our focus here, as opposed to really focusing on, oh, hey, we're running Ruby on Rails inside of it, or Node.js, or Java Spring, or whatever it might be. So with that in mind, the application we're going to make is going to be a very simple, extremely straightforward React application. So it's a React front end. We're going to wrap it up inside of a Docker container and learn how to test it and deploy it automatically. Now, again, we're not going to have to write any code for this thing. We're going to use a tiny little project generator. Now, the first thing we're going to do is make sure that you have Node.js installed locally. So at this point in time, I'd love if you opened up your terminal and ran Node-V at your command line. If you see a version like this print out, great, you're good to go. You can pause the video right now and skip over to the next section. If you run node-v and you see something that says command not recognized or command not found, then you're going to have to install node.js to get through the next couple of sections. To install node.js, you can open up a new browser tab and do a Google search for node download. And then the URL that you're looking for is something like nodejs.org slash a particular language. For me, it's English slash download. Now once here, you can get either the long term, the stable version, LTS, or you can get the current version. Either one is going to work just fine. Personally, at present, I'm using LTS. So you can select either version and then grab either the Windows installer or the Mac OS installer. And then, of course, if you're using a Linux distribution, you could grab the binaries down here manually. Now, if you're on Windows or Mac OS, just go ahead and download the installer, run it, and click Next a couple of times, and that's pretty much it. I'm not going to show you the installation process because honestly, it's really, really straightforward. Just download that installer and run the thing. After you go through the installer, you should then be able to open up your terminal. Now, it's really important if you use the installer, you need to first quit your terminal entirely. So make sure you completely quit it and then start it back up. Once you restart your terminal, you should then be able to run node-v and you should see that version appear. All right, so once you got node installed, Take a quick pause, I'll meet you up in the next section, and we're going to generate this tiny little React project and then wrap it up inside of a Docker container. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we walked through the process of installing Node.js on your local machine if you haven't already. Again, we're just kind of somewhat randomly picking React as a target here or kind of as the project that we're going to wrap up inside of a Docker container just because it kind of already comes with a little bit of batteries included stuff and honestly if you're here and learning about Docker well you probably are, have some interest at least somewhat in React anyways. So now that we have Node.js installed we're going to install a little tool that is used to generate a empty React project and then we're going to wrap that React project up inside of a container. So to install the tool that we're going to use to generate the React project, I'm going to run at my command line npm install dash g create react app, like so. Now, if you are new to the Node.js world, we just installed Node in the last section. Along with your Node install, you also installed npm. So that should already be on your machine. So I'm gonna run that command and I'm just gonna let it do its little install. It's a very small package, so no problem there. It should just take a moment or two to install. Once you've got it installed, we'll then use it to generate a tiny little React project. So inside of a workspace directory of sorts, again, this is just a folder that I place a couple of different projects inside of, I'm gonna generate a new React project by running create React app, and then the name of our project. And we're going to call this one frontend, like so. Now it's going to generate a new React project inside of a new folder called front end. 
Doing this installation here of dependencies is going to take a couple of minutes, so let's take a quick break right here and we'll continue in the next section. In the last section, we generated a brand new React project. In this section, we're going to learn how to work around with this project just a little bit in case you're new to the Node.js or React.js world. Again, we're not really quite so much focused on the code that is running inside the container. We're really much more interested in how this container is going to interact with the outside world. So with that in mind, I'm going to first change into the directory that was created when we just generated our project. So remember, we called our project frontend. So I'm going to change into that thing. And then inside of here, we're going to run a couple of different commands to understand how we're going to interact with the project. The three commands that we're going to need to be aware of, and these are commands that we're going to run several times as we develop this entire workflow, are npm run start, run test, and run build. npm run start is a development only command. It starts up a development server, which is used to host our application and make it available inside of our web browser. Now it's very important to note that this development server that is created is very much a development server. It is not appropriate for use in production. And so when it gets to figuring out how we're going to take the Docker container and deploy it to the outside world, well, we're definitely gonna have to do a little bit of follow-up on, on that side of things. The next command to be aware of is npm run test, which is used to run any tests that are associated with the project. When we generate our React project, it automatically gets one or two tests created for us. We're not going to add any additional tests because, of course, this is not a course about testing or React.js or anything like that. Instead, we're just going to run those tests and say, OK, we know how to run tests. Really much more concerned about tests here in the context of making sure that we only deploy our application if all the tests are successfully passing. The last command that we need to be aware of for, aware of for right now is npm run build. This command is used to take all the JavaScript files that are tied to the project and essentially concatenate them all down into one single file that can then be served in a production environment. Let's very quickly run each of these commands just to make sure that we're familiar with how they work because understanding them is going to be just a little bit important later on. Now, when I say, just a quick aside here, in case, again, you're not from the React world or JavaScript world, when I say understand these commands, I don't mean to say you have to understand like how JavaScript works or how React.js works. I just mean to say, understand that if we want to run our application in a development environment, we have to run this command. Again, knowledge of React here, really not required one bit. All right, so first off, we'll try running our tests. To run the tests, we'll execute npm run test, like so. That's going to start up a test runner. We're going to see our one test pass, and it looks like, yep, it's good to go for right now. We can then press Q, and that will exit the test runner. We'll then try npm run build. So I'll enter npm run build again inside of my front end directory. When I execute that, it'll say creating an optimized production build. Again, this is going to take all of our different files and essentially just kind of compact them all down into a single file. We can then list out all of our files and folders. You'll notice that there is now a build directory. This folder was not there before. If I look inside the build directory, I'll see that I have a index.html file and a static directory. Inside of the static directory is, well, it's kind of nested in there, but somewhere inside of there is a JavaScript file. This represents the actual JavaScript that is our application. And so at some point in time, we're going to want to serve up this index.html file and JavaScript file from some AWS instance or some AWS service. Now, last command is npm run start. Again, that's going to start up a development server. So I'll execute npm run start like so. That's going to automatically open a tab inside of your browser at localhost 3000, and you'll see the default React application appear. All right, so that is, again, all you really need to know about the application for right now. We've got a command to start up the thing in development. We got a command for tests, and we got a command to get the thing ready to be ran in a production environment. I'm sure you can kind of imagine how there are analogs or very close analogies to each of these commands with other languages as well. So if you're making use of Ruby on Rails, well, npm run start is very similar to like Rails S. Right? And if you're making use of, say, Go, there's a handful of builders out there to run your application in development. But to actually build your application, where you would normally run something like Go build, well, here we're going to instead run npm run build. So the whole point here is that we have some very specific set of commands that get us ready for development 
get us ready for tests, and get us ready for production. All right, so let's take another quick pause right here, and we're going to start thinking about how we're going to wrap up our application inside of a Docker container that is appropriate for development, specifically development purposes. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about how it's probably going to make sense to have two different Docker files. One Docker file will be responsible for running your application development, the other in production. In this section, we're going to start working on the Docker file that is going to run our application in development. So let's get to it. I'm going to flip back over to my terminal, and I'm going to open up my code editor inside of our project directory. Inside of this project folder, I'm going to create a new Docker file, but I'm going to give it a name slightly different than the name that we've seen before. I'm going to create a file called dockerfile.dev. The purpose of the .dev on the end right there is going to make sure that it's really clear that this Docker file is only used when we are trying to run our application in a development environment. In the future, we're going to put together a second Docker file for running this thing in production, and it's going to have a name of simply Docker file. So that Docker file that is named simply Docker file will be the one that we use for production. Otherwise, if we're running locally and we're trying to actively develop our application, we'll build our image and we'll start up our container using the dockerfile.dev file instead. So inside of the dockerfile.dev file, we're going to write out a little bit of different configuration to create an image very similar to some that we've made use of before. We're going to first start with a base image. So I'll say from node colon alpine. We'll then set up a working directory. So I'll say workdir of app. We'll then copy over our package.json. So I will copy package.json to the current working directory of slash app. And then we will run the command npm install. After we install all of, all of our dependencies, we'll then copy over everything else from our project directory. So I'll say copy dot dot. And then finally, we can run our command to start up our project with CMD. And then inside of our square braces, we'll say npm run start, like so. All right, so that's pretty much it for our development Docker file. We've ran exactly, essentially exactly the same Docker file before, so not a lot of confusion here. I think that we've got a reasonable idea of what's going to happen. Let's try flipping over to our terminal, and we're going to figure out how we can run a Docker file with a custom file name. Now, the reason I say a custom name is, remember, anytime you run Docker build, it's going to look for a file inside the current working directory called just Docker file. Let's try running that right now and just seeing what happens. I'll say docker build dot. And you'll notice that we get a little error message here. It says, hey, you don't have anything inside of here called Docker file. So in order to make sure that we build our project using the dockerfile.dev file, we're going to make a little tweak to the docker build command. So we're going to run docker build, and then we're going to add on a dash f. f means we're trying to specify the file that's going to be used to build out the image. And we'll say dockerfile.dev. And that's it. We'll put the dot on there, and that's it. And that, there we go. OK, so it's going to now load up our image. It's going to create, or excuse me, the Docker file and create the image. Now, as we're building the image, you might see a couple of warnings appear here. That's totally fine. You could ignore the warnings. If you see anything that specifically says error, that's when we want to start to get a little bit concerned. All right, so let's take a quick pause right here, and we'll continue in the next section after we successfully built our image. In the last section, we built out our Docker image using the development Docker file that we just put together. When we built that image, you might have noticed that we got a little line here that we did not see previously. It says sending build context to Docker daemon, and then it printed out 155 megabytes. So why are we seeing that here now when we definitely did not see it previously? Well, here's the issue. When we just installed the Create React App tool and used it to generate a new project, that tool automatically installed all of our dependencies into our project directory. So our node modules folder right here has a ton of different dependencies inside of it, 155 megabytes worth. Now in the past, we did not install any of our dependencies into our working folder. Instead, we relied upon our Docker image to install those dependencies when the image was initially created. So at present, we essentially have two copies of dependencies, and we really do not need two. 
The easiest solution here is to delete the node modules folder inside of our working directory, which I'm going to do right now. So I'll delete that entire folder by moving it to trash. If I now go and try to build my image a second time using docker build and then forcing the dockerfile.dev file to be used, you'll notice that it goes much faster. Much faster like it was previously when we were putting together our node server using docker. All right, so that's a good little fix. Let's take another quick pause and then try starting up a container out of this image in the next section. In the last section, we solved a little issue with duplicate dependencies. I now want to try taking this image ID right here and creating a container out of it, and then just making sure that we can access our development server. So I'm going to copy that ID and I'll execute docker run, and then I'll paste that ID in. Now, when I run that, we're going to very quickly see our development server start up. And then we get a message right here that says we can access our development server by visiting localhost colon 3000. So let's try that out in our browser right now. I'll make a new tab and go to localhost colon 3000. And when I do, I see this site can't be reached. So remember, this is a little gotcha that we saw much earlier in the course. Anytime that we want to expose a port from our Docker image or the Docker container to our machine, we have to add on that dash P flag to map out the ports that we want to expose. So I'm going to take port 3000 on my local machine and map it up to port 3000 inside the container. I'll then still paste the container ID or excuse me, the image ID right after. Let's try running that again. We're gonna see the development server start up. And again, we see starting up on localhost 3000. And now if I flip back over, chances are you'll see the page automatically refresh. If it doesn't, you can manually refresh and you should see the welcome message appear right here. Okay, so that's definitely a good start. I now wanna try making a little bit of a change to the source code of the React project and just see what occurs. In my terminal, or excuse me, my code editor, I'm going to open up the SRC directory and then I'll find the app.js file. Inside of here, you can scroll down a little bit and see the text that shows up on the lower half of the screen inside the browser. So it says to get started, edit source app.js. That is the text that shows up right here in the browser. So let's try replacing that text and just seeing what happens. So I'm gonna highlight that entire line, I'll delete it and I'm gonna replace it with something like, hi there, like so. So I'm gonna save that. And then if I go back over to my browser and refresh the page, well, of course there's no change. Remember, this is what we saw before. When we start up our image, or when we initially create the image, we're essentially taking a snapshot of all of the source code inside of our project directory. And we're building our image with that snapshot. So if we want to somehow get changes to be reflected inside of our container after we make them, we need to either rebuild the image or figure out some clever solution. Well, of course, we probably do not want to rebuild the image every time we make a change to our source code. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and figure out a clever solution to make sure that any changes that we make to our source code get automatically propagated into the container as well. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started to run into a problem that we've seen once before inside this course. We made a change to the source code of one of our files, but that change was not immediately reflected inside of the running container. In this section, we're going to figure out how we can somehow get this change to somewhat cleverly show up inside of that running Docker container without us having to stop it, rebuild the image, and then restart the container. So let's get to it. I want to first begin by giving you a quick reminder of how our Docker file is currently working. We first begin by copying over the package.json file. We then run npm install. And then most importantly, we run that copy command, which takes the public directory the SRC directory and everything else inside of here and copies them over into our working directory of slash app. So just remember that for a second. All right. So I want to show you that same flow kind of in a diagram format. So like we just said, we get our package.json copied over, not reflected in this diagram. We install the dependencies. And then at some point in time, we make a copy of SRC and public and we move those copies into that container. Remember that that is a temporary container that is created during the image building process. When we make these copies over here, we are essentially taking a snapshot of the contents of SRC and public. It's a snapshot that is locked in time and by default is not going to be updated anytime we make a change to this code. 
So in order to get these changes that we're making to files inside of SRC and public, we need to kind of abandon this approach of doing the straight copy. So rather than doing the straight copy, we're going to adjust the docker run command that we use to start up our running container. By adjusting this command, we're going to be making use of a feature included with Docker called volumes. So we're going to make use of a Docker volume. With the Docker volume, we essentially set up a placeholder of sorts inside of our Docker container. And so we're no longer going to copy over the entire SRC directory or the entire public directory. Instead, you can kind of imagine that we're going to put a sort of, that's not how you spell it, we're going to put in a kind of reference here instead. The volume is essentially going to set up a reference that's going to point back to our local machine and give us access to the files and folders inside of these folders on the local machine. So a Docker volume can kind of be thought of in a very similar fashion to the port mappings that we were setting up before. The port mapping that we were using mapped a, contain or me, a port inside the container to a port outside the container. With a Docker volume, we're essentially setting up a mapping from a folder inside the container to a folder outside the container. Now you might be wondering, why did we not just make use of volumes before? If this kind of solves the issue of hooking up files and folders inside the container to files and folders outside of it. Well, the issue is that setting up a Docker volume is sometimes a little bit of a pain in the rear, just because of the syntax we have to use when we run Docker run. So let's take a look at the syntax we're going to use to set up these volumes when we execute the docker run command at our terminal. All right, so this is it. And as you can see, we're going to add on a fair bit here. Now we first start off with docker run dash p 3000 3000, but we're going to add on these two additional switches. Now I'm going to want to ignore this first switch right here for just a moment and just focus on the second one. So on this second little switch, we say dash V, which is used to set up a volume. And then we say dollar sign present working directory. This dollar sign with PWD or present working directory inside of that set of parentheses is a little bit of a shortcut. If you flip back over to your terminal right now and stop the running process, if you are on Windows, I want you to know right now, if you're on Windows and you're running command prompt or PowerShell, this command is not going to work, but it will work if you're running git bash. So back at your terminal, you can run PWD, and you'll see that it's going to print out the path to your present working directory on your machine. So by putting in PWD right here, we're essentially saying get the present working directory or the path to it and take this folder, like this front end folder and everything inside of it, and map it up to the app folder running inside of our container. This PWD thing right here is something that you're going to use every time if you want to use Docker Run to start up the container. And so writing out this kind of long-winded switch right here, yeah, like I said, it's just a little bit annoying. So in general, well, that's exactly why we have not used volumes up to this point. Now, again, there's this other switch on here. You'll notice that the first switch right here does not have a colon like the second one does. I want to first run the Docker run command without the first switch. So we're going to run it only with the second one and our image ID on the end. And we're just going to see what happens because you're going to notice some pretty interesting behavior. All right, so let's try running this. Now I'm going to first rebuild my image with docker build dash F docker file dot dev dot. I'm going to copy my ID and then I'll execute docker run dash P 3000 colon 3000. We'll do dash V with a dollar sign, a parenthesis, PWD. We'll then put the colon in, a slash app, and then finally I'll paste the image ID. Now again, if you are on PowerShell or if you're on Windows Command Prompt, this command is not going to work because we are making use of PWD right there. Now, if you did not install Git Bash earlier inside this course, and if you're not using Git Bash right now, well, you can either use Git Bash or in just a moment, I'm going to show you a workaround where we do not have to use this kind of long form syntax right here. So you can just hold on for a second if you're using Command Prompt or PowerShell. All right, so I'm going to start that up, and you're going to very quickly see an error message. If you read this error message somewhat closely, you'll notice that it appears that the project did attempt to start up, specifically the React project, but we got this message here that said, React scripts not found. 
So this is clearly, well, maybe not clearly, I take that back, not clearly, but let me just kind of cut to the chase here and tell you we're seeing this error message because we obviously kind of skipped off this additional little argument right here. But I wanted to show you why this argument was necessary. Let's take a quick pause. When we come back to the next section, I'll tell you about exactly what's happening right now and why we are seeing that error message pop up in our terminal. In the last section, we tried making use of that volume switch on Docker Run, but we very quickly saw an error message appear in the terminal. So let me tell you about exactly what occurred. So like we just said, when we make use of that volume command, we're essentially setting up a mapping between a file or folder inside the Docker container and a file or folder on the local folder system on your machine. The issue here is that when we set up that binding or that volume, we said take everything, let's go look at the diagram one more time, right here, we essentially said take everything inside of our present working directory and map it up to the app folder inside of our container. The issue with that is that inside of our current directory right here, you'll notice that we do not presently have a node modules folder. So when we try to take everything inside of here and map it into that app folder, well, we don't have a node modules folder, which is where all of our dependencies exist. So the node modules folder inside the container essentially got overwritten. We had a node modules folder over there. We can kind of imagine that it was right here. But when we set up that mapping, we said, hey, you know what? Anytime you try to reference node modules, just go ahead and try to look at the copy of node modules that is back inside of the front end folder. And as you very well know, we just deleted that folder a moment ago. And so we get this reference that points back to essentially nothing on the local operating system. Now there's a very easy fix to this. All we have to do is pass in an additional dash V flag. And as the only argument or the only folder path on there, we'll say app node modules. Notice how in this case, we did not put in a colon right there, right? No colon on the first one. When we use the colon syntax, we're trying to say that we want to map up a folder inside the container to a folder outside the container. When we do not use the colon and we just list a folder inside the container, we're essentially saying we want this to be a placeholder for the folder that is inside the container. Don't try to map it up against anything. So you can imagine that by putting in dash V app node modules right here, we're saying this folder set in stone, don't try to mess with it, don't try to map it up against anything else. Let's try running our Docker run command again, but we're gonna add on this dash V for app node modules. And hopefully we're gonna see that everything works as expected. So I'm gonna go back over to my terminal. I'm gonna do an up arrow on my terminal to get the most recent command. And then I'm going to go back before the first dash V and I'll add on dash V slash app slash node modules like so. So now I'm going to run this and we're going to very quickly see that our project starts up as expected. So starting the development server and there we go running on port 3000. So again, the trick here was recognizing that when we use the dash V flag, we're essentially trying to say anytime that the container tries to access something in the app directory, it's gonna reach back out of the container to the current or the present working directory on our local machine. That was a big issue because we did not want to somehow overwrite access to the node modules that we had already installed into our container. So we should now be able to go back over to our browser, go to localhost 3000, refresh the page, and we'll see hi there up here. Now here's where things get really interesting. If I go into my code editor again and open up the SRC directory and find the app.js file, we can now make a change to this. So I'll say by there, I'll save the file. And then if I flip back over, you'll notice that the text gets automatically reflected on the screen. If you don't see that automatic change, you should be able to refresh the page manually and see the new text appear. Now, just to be clear, when the text refreshes here automatically, that's a function of create React app. So that's just how React works. It will automatically refresh changes. But in order to get those automatic refreshes going, the React server needs to see the changes to the files that we are making. And so clearly by setting up this volume, any changes that we make to our local file system essentially get propagated into our container, the running container, the React server inside that running container sees the change and it updates the page. So that's pretty much it.
we've now got a solution that's going to recognize changes that we're making to our files and folders inside of our project directory and propagate them inside the container. So this is definitely an important step forward. Let's take a quick pause right here and continue in the next section. In the last section, we made use of Docker volumes to automatically get changes that we make to our source code reflected inside the container. Now, the only downside to this approach is the ridiculously long Docker run command that we have to execute at our terminal. If we stop our running container, you can press up arrow again, depending on your terminal, to get that command back up. And so you can see that there's a lot of options on here. We have to specify the port, we have to specify two volumes, and then we have to specify the image ID. So clearly this is kind of a pain right now to run this command long form. Well, quick reminder, what did we learn about just a moment ago? Just a moment ago, we spoke about Docker Compose. And the whole purpose of Docker Compose is to make executing Docker Run easier. And so even though this time around we have a single container image, or excuse me, a single Docker image, we can still make use of Docker Compose to dramatically simplify the command we have to run to start up our Docker container for development purposes. So let's create a Docker Compose file. And inside that file, we're going to encode the port setting and the two volumes that we need to create inside of the container. I'm going to flip on over to my code editor. And inside of my root project directory, I'm going to make a new file called docker-compose. Dot YML. Now the compose file that we're going to create is going to look rather similar to the one we just put together. We'll first begin by specifying a version of three inside of quotes. We'll then set up a list of all the different services or containers that are going to be created when we run Docker Compose up. Now previously, you recall we named our initial service something like Node App. We could call this one React App. We can call it Web anything you want. I'm going to go with web here just because it makes a little bit of sense. Next, we need to specify the image or excuse me, the Docker file that we're going to use to create this initial container. Before, we were able to just specify build dot. However, when we use build dot, that assumed that we had a Docker file inside of the current working directory. Let's try just sticking with build dot for right now and seeing if that's going to work out, even though our file name is a little bit different. Let's just see what happens. The next thing we're going to specify is ports. So remember, we can specify a list of ports here. So to indicate a list, we put down a single dash. I'll then put down my quotes, and I'll say that I want to map up port 3000 outside of the container to 3000 inside the container. And then finally, and this is the real good part, this is the part where we can do a shorthand for specifying our different volumes. We'll say volumes, a dash, and then we'll say that we want to do app, node modules. Remember this one right here is essentially going to say, do not try to map a folder up against app node modules inside the container. And then as a second entry, we'll do a dot, which indicates the current working directory, a colon, and then we'll say that we want to map that folder outside of the container into the app folder inside, excuse me, the dot, so the current folder outside the container to the app folder inside the container. There we go. And that's pretty much it. So now, anytime that we want to start up our development instance or development container, we don't have to do that really long Docker run command like this one right here. Instead, all we should have to do is Docker compose up. Let's try running it right now and just seeing what happens. So again, inside of my front end folder, I'll do docker compose up. Now, as you might have expected, we're getting an error message right here that says cannot find a Docker file because when we put together our initial service or the initial container right here, we said, oh yeah, build using the current directory, but inside the current directory, we don't have a Docker file. We have a docker file.dev file. Let's take a quick break. In the next section, we're going to figure out how we can force Docker Compose to build our image for this web service right here using that de.dev file. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we created a Docker Compose file to avoid having to run that really long Docker run command. However, when we tried to test out that Docker Compose file, we ran into a little bit of an issue because our Docker file is not called Docker file, which is the convention. So in order to fix this, we're going to make a slight tweak to the build option inside of our compose file. 
rather than saying, oh yeah, just look into the current working directory for that Docker file, we're going to replace that dot with two additional options. So the first thing we're going to do is add a context. This context option is essentially specifying where we want all the files and folders for this image to be pulled from. So in this case, we definitely want all the files and folders for our project to come from the same directory as Docker Compose, or essentially the current working directory. So to indicate that, we'll add a simple dot. If we had nested our React project right here, if we had nested it inside of some folder, then we would have specified that folder. So we could have said something like, look into my React project folder inside this directory to find all the files for our project. We're going to pass in a second option as well. This one's going to be a little bit more obvious. We'll say Docker file. And so this is just going to be the location of the Docker file that's going to be used to construct the image for this web service. So for this, we'll say Docker file dot dev, like so. And as you might guess, this is indicating look in the current working directory, find a file with that name, use it to build the image. All right, so let's save this and then we'll try running Docker Compose up again. So back in my terminal, I'll do Docker Compose up. And there we go. Now it's successfully building. So we're going to take a minute or two to run the npm install. Let's take a quick pause right here and just let that go. And then in the next section, we'll be able to test everything out again. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started up our docker compose up command. That is now going to start up our single container and it's going to set up two different volume mounts inside of it. One to kind of bookmark or hold on to the reference to node modules locally inside the container and the other to map up all of our source code files on our local machine into the containers app directory. I now see the successful startup message from Docker Compose. So I should now be able to flip back over to my browser, refresh the app, and still see the app appear. I should also be able to open up my browser, assuming my code editor, in the source app.js file and change the by there text again. So I'll say something like I was changed. And then if I save this, I can flip back over the browser and see that content appear. And of course, I can always refresh again and make sure that content is still there. Awesome. We've now set up the volume mounting system. There's one really interesting thing that I want to mention here. So like we've said a couple times, by setting up that volume mount, any time that the Docker container looks into the app folder, it's essentially going to get a reference back to all these local files we have on our machine. And so a question that you might be asking yourself is, inside of our Docker file, do we still have to execute this copy step right here? Because we're essentially saying copy everything over into that app directory, but then any time that the Docker container tries to look into that app directory, actually go back to the local machine that the container is running on. So in truth, we could probably get away with deleting the copy line right here. We would still want to copy over the package.json file because we do have to run npm install to get our dependencies. But as far as all of our source code goes that gets copied over the copy instruction, well, we might be able to do away without that. Now, for me personally, I would choose to leave this instruction in. And here's why. At the end of the day, we're making use of Docker Compose to solve all this kind of volume mounting stuff and all this issues with getting all of our source code over. But at some point in time in the future, you might decide to no longer make use of Docker Compose. Or alternatively, you might decide to use this Docker file right here as inspiration to set up your production Docker file. In either case, you would definitely still need to have this copy instruction right here. You would definitely need to still have the copy instruction to copy over all of your source code. And so even though it's not strictly necessary for what we're doing right now, I would probably still leave it in there kind of as a reminder or a reference for myself in the future. All right, so that's pretty much it. We have solved everything we need to solve with running our React application in a development environment inside of a Docker container. We still have a lot of work to do, however, so let's take a quick pause and continue in the next section. We've now got some solid infrastructure in place to run our container in a development environment. So we've set up both the dockerfile.dev file. We've also set up a Docker Compose file that makes executing the Docker container and starting it up just a little bit easier. We're now gonna to start to shift our focus over to running the tests inside of our container. We're gonna first focus on just running our tests in our development environment. And then we're gonna very quickly kind of take that knowledge and apply it 
to running our tests over on Travis CI, which remember is a continuous integration service specifically made to run tests for your project. All right. Now the good news here is that executing npm run test inside of our container is going to be awfully straightforward. All we really have to do is build our container using the dockerfile.dev file that we've already put together. Let's do that right now. So we'll do docker build dash f docker file.dev. I'll then put my dot on there. Let me pull that back up just because I hit enter really quickly. Don't forget the dot on the end. So that gives me my image ID right there. And now remember to run a specific command inside of that container when it starts up or to just overwrite or override, excuse me, the existing command. All we have to do is append the command that we actually want to run on the end of the docker run command. So I can execute docker run the container ID, which I just lost. Let me copy it again. And then I'll add on npm run test like so. So now when the container first starts up, it's going to execute npm run test, which starts up the test suite. We then get presented with a little interactive menu right here that allows us to run specific tests, to quit, or to rerun the test suite. Now I want you to try hitting enter right now. If you do so, you'll notice that the tests appear to not run. I want you to remember back to the when we spoke about the docker run command related to the docker CLI. When we run docker run by default, we get a connection to standard out inside the container. But for us to actually trigger or get any input into the container itself, we have to hook up to standard in as well. And we can do so by adding on the dash IT options to docker run. So let's try doing that right now. I'm going to stop the container with control C and then we'll do docker run dash IT. I'll paste in, ah, darn it, I lost the ID again. Let me build this thing one more time. Do docker, see this is why you're supposed to use tags by the way. You can tell that I'm being very naughty and not making use of tags. All right, so I'll do docker run dash IT. There's the ID and then we'll execute npm run test when the container starts up. All right, so that's better. You'll notice that when we add on the IT flags, we get a much more full screen experience here. And now when I press enter, it's going to rerun all the tests. I can hit W to go back to the menu. And I could, I don't know, I could hit quit if I wanted to quit. I could run a specific test by using P. Let's try that out. So I could do like app that matches the app.test.js file. I could hit enter and it runs just that file. So clearly we get full interactivity here. All right, so that's looking pretty good. So we can now exit out of test mode by hitting control C as usual. All right, not too bad. Let's take another quick break right here and continue in the next section. In the last section, we were able to override our default start command to run our tests. We've got Docker run. We attach a standard in and pseudo terminal to that container that gets created. We've got the ID and then the override command. When we run that, we get the output that we usually see when we run a test suite. I can then hit enter to refresh the test and yeah, it looks like everything is looking okay here. However, you're going to very quickly see that we're going to run into the exact same issue that we've been trying to solve in the last couple of sections as well. If you open up your code editor, I want you to find the SRC directory and then inside there, look for the app.test.js file. Inside of here, you'll see an it statement. So this is the actual test that is currently being executed inside of our test suite. I want to try making a modification to this file. So I'm going to highlight this it statement right here, the entire thing. I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to paste it down right underneath it. And finally, I will save the file. If we then go back over to our terminal, you'll notice that the test suite did not rerun and it still thinks that there's only one test. You can try hitting enter to rerun the test suite and it sticks at one test. So I bet you can kind of guess what's going on here. We've got a container that's been created specifically to run some tests. When we created that container, we essentially took a snapshot of all of our working files and folders and put that inside the container. So this very temporary container that we've made just to run our tests does not have all that volume stuff set up. That is the issue. And so without any of those volumes set up, we are using old and outdated files inside of our container. And any changes we make to our test suite will not be reflected inside there. 
So in this section, we're going to take a look at one or two different ways that we can possibly solve this. Now, we certainly could use a very similar approach of setting up some volumes in the same way that we, that we just did inside of our Docker Compose file a moment ago. So we could set up a second service inside of here. We could assign some volumes to it, and the entire purpose of that service would be to run our test suite. Now that's definitely a way that we're going to go. We're definitely going to give that a shot, but I first want to show you a slightly different approach, one in which we will not create a second service inside the Docker Compose file. So let me show you this second approach first. All right, I'm going to stop the running test suite by hitting Control C, and then I'm going to bring up our Docker Compose instance with Docker Compose up. All right, so that has created well, in just a second here, there we go. So that creates our single container that is running our application. Now, one possible way that we can solve this issue with our test suite is rather than making a second service inside the Docker Compose file, we could instead attach to the existing container that's, that is created. When we attach to it, we can then execute a command to start up our test suite inside there. And that will give us access to a container that already has all this volume mapping set up. So let me show you how to do that. I've got my Docker Compose container running right here. I'm going to open up a second terminal window. And then inside of here, I'm going to get the ID of our running container with Docker PS. So here's the ID of our running container. So we can attempt to execute a new command inside this container with Docker exec dash IT. I'll put that ID down. And then the command that we're going to execute will be npm run test. So essentially what we're going to do here is reuse the existing container we have. We're going to start up our test suite inside there. So I'll run that. And lo and behold, our test suite appears. It looks like it now correctly recognizes that we have two tests. And if I go back over to my code editor and find that app.test.js file again, I can delete that second it statement. So I'll highlight the second one right here. I'll delete it and I'll save the file. Then when I go back over to my terminal, you'll notice that it automatically updated and it's back to thinking that we've only got one test inside there. Perfect. So this is definitely a solution that works. However, this is not necessarily the best solution because if you are developing this application, it's going to require you to start up Docker Compose, then get the ID of that running container and run that Docker exec command, which is kind of hard to remember off the top of your head. So this is definitely a solution, but I don't necessarily think it's as good as it possibly could be. Now let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next section and we're gonna try a slightly different approach where we will add a second service to our Docker Compose file. The second service will be responsible solely for running our test suite. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we got our Docker container to be aware of changes that are made to our test files by starting up our primary container with Docker Compose and then kind of piggybacking on that thing using the Docker exec command. So we ran Docker exec with the container ID and we executed npm run test inside there. Again, I don't think this is a perfect solution because it requires you to first get a handle on the container ID. So in this section, I'm gonna show you a slightly different approach. Now, you might be thinking, Stephen, why are you showing us more than one approach? Why didn't you just show us the second approach to start with if it's so good? Well, the answer is that it's not the perfect solution. So I'm going to show you the second way of solving this. But again, it's not quite a perfect solution, just in my opinion. So let's try putting this together, and you'll see exactly why. Now, I'm going to find the terminal that's running my Docker Compose, and I'm going to stop it by hitting Control-C. And then I'll flip back over my code editor and I'm going to open up my docker compose.yaml file. So in the last solution we looked at, we kind of piggybacked on this existing service to run our tests. So with this new solution, we're going to create a completely second service inside the docker compose file, and its sole purpose is going to be to run our tests. So to create a second service, I'm going to add a new line inside of here, and I'm going to add in one level of indentation and then I'll create the second service with the name of tests, like so. Now remember, in a YAML file, it's extremely important to make sure that you get all of your tabbing and indentation correct. So make sure you've got one indentation right here, right before tests. And then for the second little option we're about to push put in here, you should have two indentations. So to build this kind of test service, we're again going to kind of copy some of the configuration you see right here. 
because we want to, again, build our container using the context in the current directory, using that Docker file. And we're also going to want to set up the same volumes that we had before. However, we do not need to specify any ports this time around because our test suite doesn't make use of any ports whatsoever because there's really no running server inside there. So for tests, I'll specify my build with the context of the current directory and the Docker file of dockerfile.dev. I'll then set up my volumes. Remember, we get a little dash in front of our volumes because this essentially represents an array. I'll set up a volume on node modules, again, to kind of set up a placeholder there and make sure we don't accidentally overwrite that directory or anything like that. And then we'll also map up the current working directory, colon slash app. And then finally, the last thing we need to do is we're going to override the starting command used when this test service is created or the test container is created. So we're going to override that starting command. We're going to make sure that it starts with npm run test rather than the default npm run start. So to override a command inside of a Docker file, we'll specify command, and then we can write out all the different parts of that command in a set of quotes in a little array. So we'll say npm run test. Now when I say little array, this technically right here is not the same type of array that a YAML file array is like that right there. It's just a slightly different notation. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to save this file. So now whenever we run Docker Compose up, we're going to start up one container that's going to be responsible for hosting our development server, and the second container that is going to be solely responsible for running our tests and rerunning any time that any file inside of our volumes change. So let's try starting these up now. I'll go back over to my command line, and I'm going to do Docker Compose up, and I'm going to add on a dash dash build to this as well. Now, technically, we've not made any changes to any of our files, but sometimes when you add on a new service, it can be a little bit finicky. So I'm just going to throw on the dash dash build. All right, so there we go. So we have our test suite running. You can kind of see the test right there. And then we also see the message saying that we can view our application inside the browser. So we can now flip back over to our code editor and attempt to make a change to our test file. Remember, that's the SRC directory. We're looking for app.test.js. So I'm going to change this thing by, again, just copy pasting down the it statement. I'll save it. And then if you flip back over to your terminal, you'll see that our test suite has reran, and it now has the two separate tests. All right, so again, this definitely works, but there is a little problem with this approach as well. With the last approach for solving the tests that we looked at, we had to remember the kind of ID of the container. We had to remember the command to execute our test suite inside there. That was the downside to the, that approach. The downside to this approach is that we are getting all the output from our test suite inside of the kind of login interface of Docker Compose. And we don't have the ability to enter any standard in output to that container. So I can't hit enter to get the test suite to rerun. I can't hit W to get any of the options inside the test suite to appear or anything like that. Now you might be thinking, okay, like Steven, that's fine. We could always try attaching directly to the container. Well, that's definitely an option. Let's take a quick pause right here. And we're in the next section, we're gonna see if we can reuse that Docker attach command that we looked at way long ago to attach directly to this container and add in some custom input by hitting enter or W or whatever it might be to manipulate the test suite. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we were able to start up our test suite separately using Docker Compose. This new container definitely respects the volumes that we've set up. So any time that we change our project files or folders, the test suite is going to see the change to those files and automatically rerun, which is definitely ideal. However, you'll notice that we've still got this kind of interactive menu right here. It would be really great to be able to press P, T, or Q to filter by file name, test name, or essentially just work around with the test suite a little bit. But we can see that if we hit enter here, or P, or Q, or T, W, whatever it might be, none of this input that we're adding into our terminal is getting sent over to the running test suite. So quick reminder on why that's occurring. Here's a diagram of what's happening right now. We've got our test container and the web container. Both of those different containers start up with a primary command. For the test container, it's npm run test, and for the web container, it's npm run start. 
Anytime a process is created inside these containers, it automatically gets a connection to standard in, standard out, and standard error. And as a reminder, standard out, standard in, and standard error are all process specific. So every different process inside this container has its own instance of standard in and standard out. Now we are currently typing in our terminal, but there's nothing in place that is taking our text input, like the keys we are pressing, and automatically forwarding that input over to standard in of the test container. That would be ideal, but it's not set up to do that by default. And unfortunately, using Docker Compose, we cannot easily set that up. So let's try taking a slightly alternate approach here. Let's try creating a second terminal window. And in that terminal window, we're going to run the docker attach command. Remember what docker attach does. With docker attach, we can forward input from our terminal directly to a specific container. Let's try that out and see if we can't kind of get that connection to the test suite and be able to hit P, Q, T, all those different things to manipulate the test suite. All right, so I'm going to open up a second terminal window. And inside of here, I'm going to get the ID of that running container with Docker PS. So here's the ID of the container. Make sure you've got the one for npm run start. I'll then try running Docker attach, and then I'll put that ID in. So again, remem remember what Docker attach does. We are attaching to the standard in, standard out, and standard error of the primary process inside that container. So in theory, if we type something into our terminal, that input will be sent to standard in on that primary process. So let's see what happens. I'll run that command, and then it looks like my cursor is just kind of hovering here, so it feels like something is going correctly. I'll try putting in P, Q, T, W, anything, and it looks like, well, it's not quite working as we expect. Okay, so let me cut to the chase here. Unfortunately, this is as good as it gets with the Docker Compose solution for running our tests. When we use Docker Compose, we're not going to be able to be able to manipulate our test suite by entering P, T, T, Q, any of these special commands. With Docker Compose, this output right here is essentially as good as it's going to get. But I still want to show you why that is. So I want to give you a little bit of a background here and kind of apply some of the knowledge we picked up earlier in the course about Docker to understand why we are not going to be able to attach directly to that container and enter in commands and have them be affecting that running test process. Okay, so kind of a deep dive here, but let's do it. So clearly when we enter in additional text here, it is not at all manipulating the test suite. I wanna open up a second or now a third terminal window. And inside of here, we're gonna start up a shell instance inside that running container. And we're going to explore some of the different running processes. So I'm going to again do Docker PS. I'm going to get the ID of that container. And I'll do this time Docker exec dash IT, the ID, and then sh. So remember what this does. This is going to run a new command inside the container with this ID. With IT right here, we are starting up a connection to standard in on this new command that we are going to run. And then sh over here on the very end is going to start up essentially a new shell or kind of a command prompt inside the terminal. Shell is very similar to bash or z shell if you use that. It's essentially just allowing us to enter some commands directly into the container. So I'm going to run that. You see that we get our command prompt right here. And then we're going to run PS, which is going to print out all the running processes that we have going on inside the container. So this is the reason why Docker attach did not quite work the way we expected. Notice how we have a PID right here of one for the command NPM. We've then got a separate process running for React script start, and yet another PID for some other scripts start thing right here. All right, so why is the text that we're entering into the attach window over here not showing up? Well, it all comes down to the different processes that have been created inside the container. You see, when we run npm run test, we're not actually running directly npm run test. In reality, what is running is the process npm. And then npm looks at the additional arguments we are providing, specifically run test, and it uses those additional arguments to decide what to do. So NPM is going to eventually start up a second process that is actually running our tests. And that is one of these two right here. I'll be honest, I don't actually know which one it is. It's essentially just one of the two. And so we might imagine that, hey, let's just say it's this one right here. That's the process that is running our test suite. So we can kind of imagine that there's a second process in here called start.js. And this is the process that is actually executing our test suite 
and receiving commands over standard in to understand when to filter down the test suite or rerun them or whatever it might be. The problem is that when we, when we run Docker attach, we always attach to standard in of the primary process of the container or the process with the process ID of one. And so that's always going to be the direct NPM command. But it's not the NPM command that is in charge of receiving those key presses and interpreting all those kind of different options we have of the P, T, and Q, and enter right here. It's the secondary process that was started by NPM. And so ideally, to be able to interact with that test suite, we would want to attach to that other command or that other running process. But unfortunately, with Docker attach, that is just not an option. Anytime we run Docker attach, we are always getting a handle on the primary process, not the secondary one over there. So like I said, unfortunately, as far as the test suite goes, this is as kind of as good as it gets. We can either execute Docker Compose to start up our tests inside of a second container. Now that's definitely convenient because we just have to run Docker Compose and boom, we get all of our tests running. But the downside to this approach is that we do not be able, we do not have the ability to kind of manipulate the running test suite with the P, T, and Q shortcuts. That's one option. The other option is to have just the single running container, so that primary container of web right here, and then we can run the docker exec command to start up our test suite inside there. The benefit to that is that we can manipulate the test suite, but as you saw, the downside was that we had to memorize that docker exec command, and we also had to get the ID of the running container. So like I said, at the end of the day, two solutions here, neither of them are really 100% ideal, but at least you can pick one of the two that you like a little bit more to run your tests if you decide to do so. Now, last thing I want to mention here is that there are definitely test suites out there for other languages or even other JavaScript test suites besides the one we are using that do not actually have this kind of command line interaction where you press in these commands and it manipulates the test suite in some fashion. There are definitely other test suites out there that you just run them and that's pretty much it. They just run and you don't manipulate them in any fashion. So it's definitely not necessarily the worst thing in the world that we can't kind of get a handle on this thing. It would be nice if we could, but unfortunately we just can't. So that's pretty much it on testing. So let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue in the next section. We've now put together an implementation for npm run start and npm run test. It's now time to think about how we're gonna treat our Docker container in a production environment where we're supposed to eventually be running npm run build. I want you to remember that npm run build is going to build a production version of the application. Essentially, it takes all the JavaScript files, processes them all together, puts them all together into a single file, and then spits it out to a folder on your hard drive. And this is actually a pretty important distinction because it really changes the mechanics behind our, how our application is served up in a development and production environment. Let me show you a diagram or two to help you understand why. Okay, so this is a diagram of how our application runs in a development environment. Inside of our web container, we have a development server. Whenever our browser makes a request to port 3000 on localhost, it's really making a request to that dev server. The development server then takes a index.html file, a main.js file, or some otherwise JavaScript file, and sends it back over to the browser. So the development server is 100% required in the development environment. It's what facilitates processing all that JavaScript and then eventually serving it up to the browser. Now again, when we move over to the production environment, this dev server falls away. It just does not exist. We instead run npm run build one time, and that gives us essentially that index.html file and the main.js file that we need to somehow communicate down to our user's browser. As a quick aside, this development server falls away because it's really not appropriate to be running in a production environment. It has a ton of processing power inside of it dedicated to processing these JavaScript files that we're putting together. And that's something that we do not need to do when we are running in production because we're no longer making any changes to the JavaScript code of our project. So what we need for our production environment is some type of server here whose sole purpose is going to be to respond to browser requests with that index.html file and some random JavaScript file that contains all the React application code. So we need to essentially put something together here that's just gonna take incoming requests and respond to them with those different files. To solve this, we're going to be making use of a server called Nginx. Nginx 
Nginx is an extremely popular web server. It doesn't have a lot of logic tied to it. It's really just about taking incoming traffic and somehow routing it or somehow responding to it with some static files, which is exactly what you and I are going to use it for. So we are going to create a separate Docker file that is going to create a production version of our web container. This production version of the web container is going to start up an Nginx instance, and we're going to use that Nginx server to produce, or excuse me, to serve up our index.html and that main.js file. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're going to come back to the next section, and we're going to start putting together the Docker file that is going to make the production version of our web container. In the last section, we spoke about how we're going to be making use of Nginx to serve up our application in a production environment. Again, we're doing this because that development server we're using is not going to be used in production. It's just not a production appropriate server. So let's talk about how we're going to get Nginx in here, first by taking a look at a quick diagram. Now, as a quick reminder, remember we already created a file called dockerfile.dev. The purpose of this file was to create a image that could be used in the development environment. We're now gonna start working on a second Docker file the second Docker file is going to make a second image that's going to run our application specifically in production. So the new Docker file that we're gonna make is gonna have a slightly different purpose and some different configuration inside of it than what we are currently doing inside of dockerfile.dev. All right, so I put together a diagram or two that kind of outlines what I kind of think we need to do here, all right? So I think that we probably need to use Node Alpine as a base because again, we do have to run that npm run build command. In order to run npm run build, we're gonna have to install all of our dependencies from the package.json file. It's just a hard requirement for building our application. So we'll copy over the package.json file, we'll install the dependencies, and then once we have those dependencies installed, we'll be able to execute npm run build. After running npm run build, and generating our production assets. Remember, we already did that one time and it generated that build directory. So these are all the built production ready files right here. After we do all that, we'll then say, okay, time to start up the Nginx server and serve the result of that build directory. So that's the idea. But in this diagram, there's kind of two big issues I wanna point out, two big issues. The first big issue is tied to this install dependency step. The dependencies that we are installing only have to be installed because we are trying to build our application. If you recall a little bit ago when we initially installed all those dependencies when we first generated our app, that was 155 megabytes worth of dependencies. And those are only required when we're trying to build the application. After we actually build the application, dependencies no longer required. It is solely that build directory so this thing right here, the index.html file and eventually the main.js files in there as well, that is the only output from the build step that we really care about. It's just that folder. And everything else inside of here, everything else inside of our code base is not required to run our application in a production environment. And so if we could avoid it, it would be really nice to avoid carrying around that 150 something megabytes worth of dependencies. The other big issue with this flow is the start nginx step down here. So I said start nginx, but uh, yeah, pretty much what? Where is nginx coming from? How, what point in time did that get installed or configured or set up in any way, shape or form? So it's clear that we've got a little bit of an issue here, not only with our dependencies, but also with the nginx server setup as well. Now I wanna do a quick aside here. I wanna open up Docker Hub and I wanna look up a repository on Docker Hub very quickly. So I'm gonna open up a new tab and I'm gonna to navigate to hub.docker.com. And then once here, you can find the Explore tab at the top. And then you'll notice the second repository, it might change over time, so it might be higher or lower, is Nginx. If you click on that, you'll then see all the documentation for the Nginx repository and just the overall image. Now you can scroll down here just a little bit and see some documentation about what it is. And you'll also see some stuff about hosting simple content right here, which is essentially what you and I want to do. So it's clear that there is a Nginx image out there and it can be probably used to host some simple static content. So it kind of seems like if you and I want to kind of start up Nginx or use this to host our application, it would be really nice to use that image inside of our Docker container. However, we already said we're using Node Alpine 
inside of our container because we have to get access to Node to install our dependencies. So essentially, it seems like we're in a situation right now where it would be really nice to be able to have two different base images. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So here's the plan. We're going to build a Docker file that has something called a multi-step build process. Inside this Docker file, we're going to have two different blocks of configuration. We're going to have one block of configuration to implement something that we're going to call the build phase. This build phase is going to have the sole purpose of using the Node Alpine image as a base, copying over the package.json file, installing dependencies, and then executing npm run build. And the result of all that is going to be that index.html, the main.js file, and essentially everything else inside this build directory right here that we need to that we need to serve up our application in a production environment. We're then going to also have a second block of configuration inside of our Docker file. When we put in a second block of configuration, we get the ability to specify a second base image. And so in this kind of run phase of our Docker file, we're going to use Nginx as the base image. Then the next step after we specify using Nginx, we're going to essentially reach over from the run phase. We're going to reach over to the build phase and say, hey, out of everything that occurred during that build phase, we want to get that build directory, that build folder that has the index.html file and the main.js file and all that other stuff we care about. And we're going to take the result of all that, just that build directory, and we're going to copy it over to our build run phase. Now, when we copy it over to the run phase, everything else that occurred during that build phase, like the use of the node Alpine image, the dependencies that we installed, all that additional stuff gets dropped out of the final result of our container. So when we just copy over just that build directory, everything else essentially gets marooned, it gets left behind, and we essentially are saying, we don't care about anything else, we just care about that build folder. So then after we copy that directory over, we essentially start Nginx, and in this case, the startup is going to work because we are using Nginx as the base. So that's it, that's how we're gonna solve this. We're gonna use a multi-step build process for our Docker container. So let's take a quick pause right here, and in the next section, we'll start writing out the Docker file to make all this stuff happen. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about how we're going to solve some issues with the production version of our container by using a multi-step build process. By using a multi-step process, we can use different base images. We can have some amount of configuration or code that gets executed to build up our application and then copy over the result of that to our actual real phase. So let's start putting together our Docker file to put this into action. I'm going to begin by opening up my code editor, and then inside of my root project directory, I'm going to make a new file called Docker file. So inside of here, we're going to have two distinctly different sections. We're going to first write out the section that's going to install all of our dependencies and run the npm run build command. Now the configuration that we're going to use for the first block or kind of this build phase is a lot of configuration that we've already looked at several times. So we'll go through it rather quickly. We'll first say from node Alpine, and then I'm going to tag this phase with a name. I can tag this by saying as, and then providing the name of this phase or this stage. So I'll call this thing builder. Oops, not that. I'll call it builder like so. By putting on as builder, that means that from this from command and everything underneath it is all going to be referred to as the builder phase. And the sole purpose of this phase is to install dependencies and build our application. Then after that, we're going to see all of the usual configuration that we've been making use of so far throughout this course. So I'll specify my work directory of app. I'll copy over my package.json file to that app directory. I'll run npm install. I'll copy over all of my source code. So notice now that we are doing this build phase and we kind of don't have any concern over changing our source code, we don't have to make use of that entire volume system anymore. That volume system that we were put implementing with Docker Compose was only required because we wanted to develop our application and have our changes immediately show up inside the container. When we're running our code in a production environment, that's not a concern anymore because we're not changing our code at all. So we can just do a straight copy of all of our source code directly into the container. 
after we copy all of our source code over, we'll then execute with the run command, npm run build. All right, and that is it. That's all we have to do for our builder step. So again, this is going to install dependencies, run npm run build, and the output of it is going to be that build folder. Now, one thing I wanna point out here is that the build folder will be created in the working directory. So the folder that you and I really care about, like the folder with all of our production assets that we wanna serve up to the outside world, the path to that inside the container will be slash app slash build. That's gonna have all the stuff we care about. So that's gonna be the folder that we're going to eventually want to somehow copy over during our run phase. Okay, so now that we've got our build phase put together, we're gonna to write out the configuration for the actual run phase. So this is going to be the phase that says we're going to use the Nginx image where we're gonna copy over the result of the NPM run build and then somehow start up Nginx. So to specify the start of a second phase, all we have to do is say from and then the name of our base image, which is Nginx like so. You'll notice that we did not have to put any terminology or any syntax in here to specify or say that the initial phase that we have right here was stopping. By just putting in a second from statement that essentially says, okay, previous block, all complete, don't worry about it. Any single block or any single phase here can only have a single from statement. So you can kind of imagine that the from statements we put in here are kind of terminating each successive block. So then inside of here, we're going to write out the command to copy over that build folder into this new kind of like Nginx container thing that we're putting together. So I'm gonna say copy, and I'm gonna say that we want to copy something from a different phase. So I'll put in dash dash from equals builder, like so. So this is saying I want to copy over something from that other phase that we just were working on. In this case, we wanna copy something over from the builder phase. We'll then specify the folder that we want to copy. So I'm gonna say app slash build, because again, that's the folder that you and I really care about. And then we'll specify where we want to copy the thing to inside of this kind of Nginx container that we're putting together. So the folder that we want to copy this stuff to, and this is kind of a little bit of configuration around Nginx specifically. If you go back over here to the Nginx documentation, on Docker Hub, and you look at that section that says hosting some simple content, it's kind of hard to see inside of here, but you'll essentially see, oh, here's a perfect example of it right here. So if we want to serve up some static HTML content, we just stuff it into this folder of user share Nginx HTML. So anything inside there is going to be automatically served up by Nginx when it starts up. Okay, so we're gonna say user Notice how there's no E in there, it's just USR. Share Nginx HTML, like so. And I'm gonna collapse my sidebar just so you can see all of that. Okay, and believe it or not, that's pretty much it. As far as actually, you know, I'd said over here, oh yeah, start Nginx. Well, it turns out that the default command of the Nginx container or the Nginx image is gonna start up Nginx for us. So we don't have to actually specifically run anything to start up Nginx. When we start up the Nginx container, it's just gonna take care of the command for us automatically. So that's pretty much it. That is our Docker file for the developer, I mean the production environment. Again, the really important thing to understand here is that we've got this multi-step process where we're creating one temporary container right here, or one set of layers right here. We execute some number of commands inside that set of layers. And then out of that set of layers, we're just copying over just the bare minimum, just the stuff we care about. So when we do this copy step right here, we're essentially dumping everything else that was created while this set of configuration was executed. So we're not pulling over anything from the Node Alpine image. We're not pulling over any of the results of the NPM install. We're not copying over any of our source code. All we are getting is the result of that app slash build directory. That's it. So our our end image is gonna be relatively small. It's gonna be essentially however large the Nginx base image is, and that's pretty much it. All right, so that's it. Now let's take a quick pause right here. I'm gonna make sure I save this file, and then we're going to test this out in the next section. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our multi-step Docker file. We're now ready to test it out at our terminal. So I'm gonna flip on over to my terminal. I'm gonna make sure that I'm still inside my front end directory. And then we're going to build that image by running docker build dot. 
Notice how we don't have to use the dash F flag on here like we were doing throughout this section so far. We were only using the dash F flag to force Docker to make use of a Docker file with a file name that was not following the convention. So now that we have a file name that follows the convention of simply Docker file, we can do simply Docker build dot. All right, so I'm gonna run that. And then very quickly, this whole thing is gonna be put together. So we're going through the NPM run build process right now. That's gonna take just a second or so. And then you'll notice that we get this second step going on. So from Nginx right there, we pull down that image for Nginx, and then we copy over everything from the builder process. And then the end result is the ID for the image that we just put together. So let's now try starting this thing up and see how we're doing. I'm gonna copy the ID and I'll execute Docker run. And don't forget, we do have to open up our ports here because Nginx is a web server. It wants to serve up traffic. So I'll say dash P. We're gonna route traffic on this thing to 8080. And the source port inside the container is gonna be the default port that Nginx uses, which is 80. So we're gonna map up 8080 on our machine to 80 inside the container. And then we'll paste the ID of the image that was just created. So I'll run that. And we're not gonna actually see any output here, which is totally fine. By default, Nginx doesn't really have a whole lot to say until you start making some requests to it. But I should be able to open up my browser, navigate to localhost colon 8080, and see the welcome to React application appear on the screen. Perfect, so that's pretty much it. We've now got a Docker file that can be used to build our application and then serve the application from an Nginx server, which is 100, 110% production appropriate. Nginx is really made for production workloads. So this is a pretty solid setup. Let's take a quick break right here. We'll continue the next section and start thinking about how we're gonna take all the work that we've done and start deploying it to the outside world. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute.